Hello, everyone. Welcome to this distinguished lecture series uh, by the International Science Council and the GEA Unions. The series is part of the year-long celebrations for the International Year of Basic Science for Sustainable Development. My name is Doreen Samantari Wace. I'm a science officer at the Center for Future Sciences, which is the, um, the think tank of the International Science Council. And before I introduce the session and the speaker, I'd like to share some housekeeping. Since this is a Zoom meeting, please do keep your microphones uh, on mute and feel free to drop your questions or comments in the chat, chat area on the bottom of your screen on the side. Um, during the questions and the answers uh, section, my colleagues and I will make sure to pick up your questions or comments and I'll give you the floor so you can ask um, you can ask your question live if you'd like to join us with your camera on. Now about our session today, the progress towards the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals requires systematic follow-ups and reviewing. And this could be done by using tracking and reporting that is based on indicators and through the integration of statistical and geospatial data. This is not an easy task, and the lecture today will provide an overview of the good practices that are recognized by the United Nations on monitoring of geospatial information, enabled SDGs, and how the overall SDG progress at a local context can be well measured by developing a set of indicator-based, data-driven, and evidence-supported approaches with geographical perspective. It is my pleasure to welcome Professor Yun Chen from the International Society of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing and the National Geomatic Center of China, where he previously served as president. Professor Yun Chen is an expert in operational land cover and tomographic mapping with space and airborne remote sensing. He led a major project in China called the Globe Land 30, which was a global land cover and mapping project of China, which also resulted in the first land global land cover data sets at a 30 meter resolution that was donated to the UN with open access. Professor Yun Chen has also worked on a local project in China, measuring the progress towards SDGs with geospatial and statistical information. This project was announced by the UN in 2020 as one of the first 16 good SDG practices. So let's now jump into the lecture by Professor Yun Chen, who is online with us now. He's recorded his lecture to ensure an optimized viewing experience for all of you. And Professor Yun Chen will then join us for the Q&A live at the end. So please do feel free to put your comments and the questions in the chat section at any time of the lecture. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Yun Chen from International Society of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing and National Geomatic Center of China. Today, it's my great pleasure to give you a presentation on how geospatial information can enable SDG monitoring. I will start by introduction, and then a local SDG monitoring, its enabling factors, and some summary. In the last three centuries, in particular, the past few decades, Humans has modified tremendously our planet land surface due to a continuing growth of population and economy. On one side, this is necessary because we need to provide sufficient critical materials to immediately human needs, such as food, shelter, and fresh water. On the other side, this has also caused some serious environmental problems, such as air pollution, traffic congestion, shortage of water and mineral resources. This has affected in the long run the human welfare. So how to sustain human well-being while reducing its negative impact is becoming a grand challenge for us. The International Society has devoted tremendous efforts to move from traditional GDP-oriented growth to sustainable development. Multiple major international agreements or agenda were approved or implemented. Milestone events include the Only One Earth concept proposed in 1972, 
and uh, 21st century agenda approved by the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development in 1992. In 2000, the United Nations Summit has approved Millennium Development Goals for 15 years. And recently, the United Nations have has approved 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The 2030 Agenda has defined 17 Sustainable Development Goals and 169 targets to promote economy, prosperity, social inclusion, and environmental protection. But they were defined as an indivisible whole like this state SDG type. Nowadays, it's becoming a top priority for United Nations member nations and international societies to implement this 2030 agenda. However, the SDG development is a very complex and a dynamic process. In order to have a successful implementation of this global agenda, we need to know how far is now from the 2030 SDGs? And where are the major gaps or problems? What actions need to be taken? So this requires a systematic follow-up and review of the progress towards SDGs at national, regional, and global levels. So this has also posed many technical and institutional challenges. In 2015, the United Nations General Assembly has adopted an indicator-based and data-driven approach for the follow-up and review of its progress towards SDGs. They have defined 234 indicators and asked to use timely, reliable, and disaggregated statistical and geo information for that. You might be interested to know why geospatial information. It's because most of the sustainable development activities take place in geospatial space. So many goals, targets, and indicators have its geospatial components. But how to use geospatial information for SDG monitoring? It's becoming a crucial task for governmental agencies and academy communities. In the past few years, the international geospatial information communities has organized many activities to this hot topic. You can see from here, from 2016, the United Nations GGIM, GU, IS, ISPS has organized a number of workshops, test, tests, pilot studies to promote the utilization of geospatial information for SDG monitoring. So you can see now a growing number of publications and practices regarding the utilization of geospatial information for SDG implementation. Also, tremendous efforts have been devoted to this hot topic. You can see now, current work were focused basically on computing single or few indicators, or assessment of individual targets and goals. But what we need is to take all indicators, targets, goals into consideration. That means we need to have a comprehensive monitoring and transform the monitoring results into actions. So for the moment, we don't have very good successful pilot study or case studies. So United Nations called for member nations and the international societies to conduct pilot studies and to develop good practices in this regard. With this background, we have selected a small country in China, Beijing, to organize some pilot studies. 
Peking is a country in the south east part of China, not far from Hangzhou and Shanghai. It was the venue of the first United Nations World Geospatial Congress in 2018, and now the headquarters of the United Nations Center for Geospatial Information and Knowledge. So we have realized the three consecutive steps. The first one we, we have done SDG monitoring with geospatial information in 2018. And in 2019, we formed the monitoring results into a spatial knowledge service hub. Later on, 2020 and 2001, we have formulated a five year action plan towards SDGs using the results of the monitoring. So, this is basically a comprehensive monitoring and also transforming the results into actions. So, now let me show you how the local SD monitoring were conducted. So the methodology has five steps. The first, the United Nations Global SDG Indicator Framework was localized according to its adaptability, comprehensive heaviness, and measurability. Then spatial temporal data will be collected and processed. The third step is to calculate all the indicators selected with geospatial information. But here we use not only geospatial information, but also statistical data. Evidence supported progress assessment were organized for indicator level, single goal level, and goal cluster level. So with that one, we form formulate the progress report. Then we define tangible actions according to the progress report to formulate a five years action plan. The first step is localizing the United Nations indicators according to the local situation. If you look at this one, you see United Nations has 234 indicators. For SDG 1, it has 14 indicators. But for this county, we have selected five indicators for that. The basic principles we use is if this indicator suits local situation, if it enables international national comparison, and if there is reliable data. So if we look at this one, we have 47 indicators adopted, seven, six extended, 42 revised, and there, there were also seven indicators for substituting. So for this country, we have finally selected 102 indicators. We summarize the methodology as adoption, extension, revision, and a substitution strategy for the localization of the indicators. But the 102 indicators covered all the 16 SDGs. This here, they have not all seen, so we don't have the goal 14. So it makes it a comprehensive measurement because it covers all the 16 SDGs. So for the second step, we have collected more than 200 types of data and processed them, including topographic, land cover data, earth observation imageries, socioeconomic statistics, and other data from social media. This is the population data. It's based on the administrative unit. You can see from here, the spatial details are smoothed out, you could not find that. So in order to have a detailed spatial variation of the population, we used the land cover data. We established a relationship between population density and residential data. So we derived the population density at a 30 meter spatial resolution. It could provide, you see, more spatial details. 
With this one, you can have better geospatial and statistical analysis. The third step is measure local SDGs with a geospatial lens. So in total, we have 102 indicators. They were measured in three different ways. One is direct calculation with statistical data. You see 85 indicators were derived like this way. There were 10 indicators were derived directly from the geospatial data. We used the spatial density calculation, coverage classification, and others. There were also seven indicators who were derived or calculated by integrating both statistical and geospatial information. Um, we use a methodology like quantitative measurement of spatial accessibility, the coverage, spatial relations. Here you have some examples. 1.4.1. Population proportion living in with access to the basic services. 3.8.1 coverage of state health service. This is 6.61 change in the extent of water related ecosystem over time. And 11.3.1 ratio of land consumption rate to population growth rate. And also 15.2.1 proportion of forest change. Let's look at one example in detail. You see, with the traditional population census data, we could not get the spatial details of the population. But with the geospatial disaggregated population density data, we can get the details so we can calculate time cost for any point to its nearest, nearest hospital. So it means that we can combine the geospatial disaggregation population density and those networks and calculate its spatial accessibility. Like this one, you can see how many minutes people can get the nearest hospital. For instance, 83.9% of people could get near this hospital within 20 or to 25 minutes. So this is a map. You can see the time arriving at the healthcare facilities. This is the time. This one is the time people could not get the higher healthcare facilities within 20 minutes, that is over 20 minutes. So with this one, we can have a very good spatial temple analysis or spatial accessibility for the essential services. The fourth step is evidence-supported assessment at three levels. So the first level is indicated level. All the indicators were contrasted and ranked with SDG index and dashboard or national plan mandate requirements. For each of the 16 SDG goals, we use grouped focus analysis and quantified indicators and evidence to evaluate each SDG goal. Then the three SDG clusters, economy, society, environment, were also assessed. Here is an example for indicator level assessment. For SDG 6, you see we have these indicators 6.1, 6.2.1, A, B, 6.3.1. So we have the quantitative results derived from geospatial information or the combination of geospatial and uh, statistical data. Then we found the evaluation references from United Nations dashboard or national mandate requirements. So with all these metrics, we can uh, classify the indicators into 
four different quarter. The first quarter is very good. Second one quarter is good, something like that. So you from you see for SDG six, most of the indicators are very good. Some are good, but for this one, for instance, we don't have the matrix, so we could not compare. This is the assessment results of all indicators. For all the 102 indicators, we have a benchmark of references for 79 indicators. So 68 of them reach or close to the objective of 2030 SDG, but nine needs improvement for facing challenges. Like this one. In order to derive a meaningful result for each goal, we need to group our original numerous targets into fewer subsets, what we call here local targets. Like this one, SD6 has so many sub targets. But then we used the focus analysis method. To clean, group them into clean water and water resources utilization, protecting water related ecosystems. Then the focus will be clean water, volume quality and efficiency of water, and sustainability of water related ecosystems. Quantifying indicators like this one and spatial temporal evidences like time series data, imageries, maps, local knowledge were used to do the focal, focused analysis. This is the result for SDG6. It's yellow, means it's good, not very good. For all the 16 SDG goals, these are the evaluation results. You see, eight SDG goals basically fulfilled the requirements, or means they have reached to the standards. But six SDGs need to be improved. It's yellow. And two are facing challenge. For instance, the local people have shut down polluted industries with ecological compensation. They have treated water, wasted water in both urban and rural areas. So now the what quality of its 34 major rivers has reached the standards? So they have now very good safe drinking water. But from this one, you can see there's still some risk because you can find intensive population in the sources of drinking water. Still some. How many theories image data were used? To analyze the changes of what related ecosystems in the past 35 years. It's found that the water related ecosystem has changed and its change is estimated at 6.70%. The assessment of the goal cluster were organized by mapping all the 15 SDGs into economy, society, and environmental clusters according to their contribution or relevance to their indicators. You can see for the economy cluster, it has related as five SDGs. For environment, it has also five. For social harmony, it has 12 SDGs. The degree of coordination within each cluster and among them were used to evaluate the SDG clusters. It, the results show that there is good coordination among the three SDG clusters, like it show like this one. And it means that the country has made significant economic and social advances, and at the same time, a good ecological environment was maintained over the past few years.
One good example is the Kresge the Ibis is coming back. So we know Kresge the Ibis is one of the endangered bird species. It was disappeared from this region in the late of 1950s. About 10 years ago, people brought back 33 Kresge the Ibis species. And now the number is reached to more than 300 in 2000. 18. Why is that? We can give you some evidence. For instance, here, the refuse collection and harmony treatment is 100%. And good rate of air quality condition is 97 point. And the drinking water quality is level 2. Forest cover rate is 46.1. With all that, we managed to prepare and uh, finalize a progress report about the 13 counties SDG progress in both English and Chinese. In this report, you see we have uh, briefly introduced the methodology. They give a detailed description of each SDG assessment results, and also the results of the three SDG clusters, economy, environment, and the social harmony. What's interesting, you can see here, the English version has 80 pages, but for Chinese version, the same content, it has only 70 pages, a little bit shorter. So with this report, we managed to answer two basic questions. One is, how far is Beijing County from the 2030 SDGs? The second is how to conduct a comprehensive monitoring of the progress towards 2030 agenda by integrating statistical and geospatial information. So the United Nations and the local government were very pleased with our work. They have released the progress report at the first United Nations World Geospatial Information Congress in November 2018 in Dutch. Because you, from this report, this work, you can see the overall SDG progress at the entire administration treaty region can be well measured and assessed by integrating geospatial and statistical information. This is exactly what the United Nations would like to achieve or to see. The final the, or the fifth step is transforming the monitoring results into actions. From the results of the assessment, you can see there are still some indicators need to be improved and some other indicators facing change. It's the same for SDG goals. The six needs to be improved to a facing challenge. It means there's still room to be improved. For instance, industrial emission to be further reduced, the public transportation companies also to be improved. Now, we have the monitoring results. From a knowledge point of view, we see this is a systematic knowledge about current status. But we have also the local development region, it's the good knowledge. So what we have, we are going to do is to find the transformative knowledge. It means we define tangible decisions and actions. So because with the monitoring results, we, we know where we stand, what are the gaps, then we try to define the actions. The main purpose is to develop a five years action plan for the country. So with this background, we have set up SDG Noji Services Platform and transforming the SDG evaluation re report into a knowledge hub. Then we use develop the data 
to do gap analysis like uh, how what could not fail to reach the basic criteria we need to have further improvement what's the potential risk with all that we can use them as the evidence so then we do some spatial simulation trend forecasting to simulate how the decisions could, should be made what should we do with all that then with all this knowledge we can further design the possible projects or actions through feasibility analysis match analysis and even achievement analysis a sdg knowledge service system was developed with five S level SDG knowledge graph nodes. That is, we have uh, domain knowledge, it's a cluster, and uh, goal knowledge, like goal six, and uh, local targets, knowledge points, and uh, data facts. They form a SDG graph, and they can facilitate the analysis and, and the use of the monitoring results. This is uh, the SDG node service system. For instance, for each ago, zero hunger and uh, clean water, each ago you can find its details like uh, indicators, the local targets, knowledge points, and data facts. They were organized like this one, like a, a knowledge graph with all the local targets, knowledge points, and data facts. With the support of the knowledge system, you can easily do the gap analysis. For instance, with this one, you can analyze where, how is geographical coverage of essential services, how long you can get access to the nearest urban open space or other essential services. This is something for the school bus. How long your kids could go to take a school bus? So with all that, we know the gaps, we know the problems, then we can propose some actions or projects. So we're working together with a local planning agency. They have done tremendous work and decided to invest billions of money in some projects. This is some project related to SDG 6, 7, 11, 12, 13, and 15. For instance, this is a, a project for water quality management. They have concrete or tangible actions, concrete projects, and responsible people for that. So in total, 147 actions has been planned for implementing 230 SDGs with invested projects. So here for instance, for SDG 1, we have the local people have decided to have eight actions. For SDG 2, also eight, eight actions. For SDG 11, it's 10 actions. We put our, all together into the country's plan on implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development for the period of 2021 to 2025. So this five-year action plan was officially released in June 21st by the county government. So I think this is maybe the first county action plan in the world. Now let me know the enabling factors of this local SDG monitoring. First, I would say in 19, in 2020 December, the United Nations DESA has published a booklet and they have selected the first 16 good practice in SDG implementation. So our work was one of them. 
It is also the only one regarding the use of geoinformation for supporting SDG implementation. Why? Because in this case study tells you that geospatial information plays an irreplaceable role in SDG implementation. So what are the enabling factors? I think there are at least three major enabling factors. One is availability of reliable geospatial information. The second is appropriate location of SDG indicator and targets. The third one is constructive engagement of stakeholders and the innovative partnership. Firstly, availability of reliable information. So you can see there are some indicators and targets. They could only be derived, analyzed from a geospatial lens. So it means an SDG monitoring will not be comprehensive without the utilization of geospatial information. I listed a number of kilos of geospatial information, like disaggregating census data of geo in geospatial space, providing geospatial parameters, and many others. For this project, we have developed some operational and automatic techniques, like generating timely and reliable land cover and other core geospatial data, integrating native big data, they include social media and other core sourcing data. But what I would say that the local people, they have devoted significant efforts to generate reliable and time series geospatial information and provided us a very good basis for this pilot study. The second one is localization of SDG indicators and targets. We know that a successful monitoring of SDG progress depends on the localization of indicators and also internationally recognized benchmark or references. So if you look at the localization of indicators, it's a very challenging task and demands interactive multidisciplinary collaborations. We have very good collaboration with statisticians and many other people, experts. And also we need to have very carefully work for localization of SDG targets, like how could we derive meaningful assessment and also the selection of objective elevation criteria is another key component because it will assure a reasonable comparison and ranking. So in our case study, we have develop, developed some approaches to localize indicators, group targets, select objective elevation criteria. So it helped us to get some good, meaningful results and reasonable comparison. The third is engagement of stakeholders and the innovative partnership. You see, in order to conduct such a comprehensive monitoring of SDG progress, we need constructive engagement of scientific users, policy, and other communities. So for our case study, we have seven research institutions and universities. We have people from sustainability, earth science, geography, remote sensing and GIS, statistics, computer sciences, and different disciplines. So we have formed a good multidisciplinary task force. On the other side, we have 20 local government agencies and organizations joined us. We have very strong multi-stakeholders engagement. It enabled the mobilization of considerable resources and support and the device of local transformative actions. In addition, we have got also good support for, from the United Nations State Division, United Nations GGIM, National and the Provincial Bureau of Statistics. So we have got support from high-level national and international expert group. It means that the cooperative engagement of the stakeholders and the innovative 
partnership could facilitate and provide multidisciplinary expertise and could mobilize all the necessary resources for the monitoring. So I have some summary now. From my presentation, I try to tell your story about how geospatial information can help a comprehensive SD monitoring at a local context. You can see there is an indicator-based data-driven and evidence-supported methodology. Basically, it takes geographic perspective into consideration with the help of multi-scale temporal geospatial data. And this methodology has been used or applied to a, a local country. Then we localize the UN SDG indicators, assessed or evaluated the SDG progress, translated the monitor results into tangible actions. So there are a few enabling factors. Data availability, localization, and the partnerships. Saying all that, I would say there is still a number of issues to be investigated. For instance, how could we organize a dynamic monitoring with essential variables and SDG simulation development, SDG simulation models? So, as I said in the beginning, I'm from ISPS. ISPS has sub substantial expertise related to SDG monitoring and the practices like geospatial modeling, geospatial information extraction, geospatial analysis, and the data and the platform. We have also very long collaboration with ISC, Geo Union, and other societies. What are we say that? We cannot solve all the, all the problems by ourselves. We need to work together with geo unions and other societies. So if we want to go far, go together. So let's work together under the umbrella of ISC, ISC Geo Union to support the United Nations 2030 SDG agenda. That's all I would like to say today. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much to Professor Yenchen. A wonderful, wonderful presentation. Um, so many interesting information. And I have to say a great conclusion, um, uh, calling for the collaboration and, uh, and continuing this great effort um, all around. Um, I don't know if you have questions. My colleagues will definitely highlight this. Um, I do see a hand already up by Alec. Um, so maybe Alec, yes, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> First of all, uh, thanks for your wonderful lecture. Uh, it's really provide a way on monitoring of SDGs using geospatial information where you are expert, but as well as uh, showing the, how the basic science and scientific methods works to help to uh, really monitor of this uh, important uh, problem. Uh, we, uh, my question actually related to SDG. Sorry, I have been muted. Correct? We hear you. Now we hear you. Yeah, yes. yeah because it was a very strange. Sorry. Uh, my question is related actually to SDG interactions. Um, what I mean, actually, uh, even probably you remember in 2016, ICSO, a predecessor of the International Science Council, developed a discussion paper. Uh, and even I think a framework at that time related to understanding of SDG interactions. Actually, the implicit logics of the agenda for uh, sustainable development tells us that it's, uh, each SDG depends on each other. I mean, the SDGs depend, correct? Um, 
but how explicitly they do and how to monitor their interaction. Uh, for example, uh, it was some example uh, that's uh, related to coal. Yeah? If you use coal to improve energy access, for example, related to goal uh, seven, yes, uh, in some country, would uh, this uh, using of this uh, uh, coal uh, would accelerate climate change and in some cases even in the acidity of oceans. Uh, but this will uh, undermine the goals uh, other goals, I think 13, which, which is a climate, and uh, 14, which is uh, related to oceans, as well as uh, irritate the other problems, such as the damage to health and so on. I mean, meaning that it's a, there is an interaction between the goals, and that is a, was a major topic of discussion by um, uh, ICSO at that time. Now my question, did you, in this uh, wonderful work, estimate interaction between the targets in the, during the CEO monitoring, SDG monitoring. How, for example, the one successful, uh, let's say, story in the particular uh, goal may affect their other goals, implementation of other goals and so on. How they influence towards each other. That's the question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ali. It's a very good question. Yeah, it's uh, what uh, we, we want to do in the near future. Uh, as I said, we started and uh, by monitoring the progress within, with geospatial information. Then we translated or converted into SDG knowledge hub. Then we tried to transform that into tangible actions. But for the moment, we haven't got good uh, progress on the SDG interactions, not yet. But from this year, we start to develop a, a, a dynamic monitoring system. Before it's a static monitoring. So now, uh, right now we are working on that. And this, this is the first step. And the coming, the fifth, fifth step, we would like to simulate the interactions between different SDG goals. Yeah, uh, what I would call it, uh, try to develop an SDG model, something like that. But with that, we need to have a good collaboration with uh, uh, people like us uh, scientists and uh, uh, sustainable development experts, even AI expert. Currently, you see that small country is becoming the United Nations Geospatial Information and the Knowledge Center. So it will have a number of uh, uh, experts. So tomorrow we will have a meeting and we have experts from, from uh, different countries to, to come together. So uh, we'll continue work on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Jureen, if there is uh, no yet more question, I have a one more question. It's a, just a very simple question probably related to the excellent methodology. How much it was used in the Chinese provinces, municipalities in uh, other than you presented? Uh, if uh, not yet, uh, what are the difficulties to really uh, uh, let's say make make it uh, use not only even in China but in other uh, let's say Asian or other countries. Uh, well, I mean, it's, this methodology is quite nice because it's not only scientific but also practical methodology. How to link this information to the policy makers? How to work with them together to deliver the proper solution? The question about this: uh, uh, How much this methodology are in use in your country? and probably abroad. Yeah, now we, there are a number of uh, cities or provinces who are working and take the same methodology. You use the method and do their own SDG monitoring. But the question is that a comprehensive monitoring is very costly. Yeah, so they use the methodology for a number, a few uh, goals, uh, dozens of indicators. What's interesting is that uh, uh, UNSCAP 
they have organized a number of uh, training courses in South uh, East Asia countries. We train the people there and they followed our methodology. They are doing uh, their studies. You know, Alik, uh, we were a little bit delayed because of the COVID-19. Yeah, but from this year, we are continued. We start to, uh, to organize the international seminars and the training courses. In China, we have a, a national I say standard committee. It's also ISO a committee on uh, urban sustainable development standard committee. So they want me to, to chair the committee. So we decided a few days ago to convert a number of our work into national standards. So I, I hope it will help. But of course, the most difficult question is that uh, is a localization of uh, the SDGs and the SDG indicators and the uh, targets. That's the most difficult. We need to have a very long collaboration, discussing, negotiating with uh, state teachings, with uh, people from United Nations, state unity division, something like that. Yeah, but we're still working on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, so great to hear all of the, the different aspects that has to be considered for this methodology. Um, we have a next question from Kathy Waller or Wheeler, if I'm, if I'm saying it right, please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much for a really interesting um, presentation. Uh, my question actually follows on very nicely from what Alec has just asked, because I'm interested in how you go from the monitoring to the practice and what the challenges you found in getting, because the practitioners are often not scientists, not so familiar with the methodology and the details of the data acquisition and processing. So what were the challenges in going from the monitoring to the practice? And, and maybe if you could give an example of how you overcame them. Yeah, so we try to develop some tools for that. For instance, the R2, when you have the, uh, local population sense data, how to convert that into uh, geospatially distributed uh, data. So we developed some tools. And the other thing is that we try to set up some, uh, I don't know how to say it, some uh, case studies, examples. So people can uh, take a look of what we or others did in other, place, uh, other places. So we have organized uh, for the United Nations uh, uh, at least the three uh, training courses, tell people, as I said to Ali, the I, I found the most difficult is not the computational methodology. It's uh, the localization of uh, United SDGs according to local situation. That's the most difficult because you see, uh, the EU has 234 indicators, but it's defined for national level. But when we work at the provincial city level, it's a total, it's quite different. That's the most difficult. Some people say that why uh, uh, ask, uh, may, maybe we can take the select the uh, in, according to the requirements, but that are not low international comparison. So basically we think we should follow the United Nations framework. Yeah, I mean, localization the United Nations framework, that's most difficult. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Yun Chen. Um, thank you very much. I do have a question. Um, I was wondering with the amount of data that was coming in and um, all the information that you were gathering and, and looking into these different um, data sets according to the indicators, where, was there anything surprising in terms of um, maybe discrepancies or something that you just didn't expect that uh, yeah came up and you wanted to investigate further there? I could not get it. Uh, sorry, I missed the your question because of the, the yes 
the internet. Can, can you repeat the question, please? Sure, I can repeat it, yes. I was just wondering if there was anything surprising that you found while you were collecting the data and it, according to all these indicators, if you, if you saw any, any major discrepancies, for example, or something that you were just not expecting. Uh, I, I didn't catch your question, but uh, what what I've said, data is another challenging issue for SDD monitoring. But we were lucky because the country has a very good work, work for geospatial data. I, I would say that most of the data are already that, that reliable, good quality, but I'm not sure if it's the same in other places. Yeah, because I, I, I have been working on global land cover data. I know in many other places, even uh, in some some places in Asia countries, we could not have good, reliable land cover data. But for this small country, they have a very good basis. So we, I would say we would encourage the local authorities to develop reliable data, not only for STD, but for, for everything. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we do have a question from Klaus Hinsby, and this will be the last question since we're very uh, short on time. Please go ahead, Klaus. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm Klaus Hinsby from uh, the uh, Geological Survey of Denmark and Greenland and the co-chair of the Water Resources Expert Group of the Eurojo Surveys. Um, thanks a lot for this very nice and, and relevant presentation. I was wondering, since you a, a part of your presentation was uh, on SDG six on uh, clean water, I was wondering to what extent you included the subsurface, uh, so so primarily uh, groundwater resources, if, if if that was part of the your assessments. Uh, basically, it's uh, we are working on groundwater, not on the groundwater. Yeah. So, sorry, I, I didn't get that. Basically, you are. Yeah, no, it's uh, we're working on the uh, not underground water resources. Yeah, just the surface water. Surface water. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do see one question. Um. I'm wondering, yes, I think we have time for one last question. Um, so this is about recommendation. Um, do, do, do you prefer, Professor Yun Chen, that the recommendation will be solved? What we recommend, what we recommend, is it, is it that you prefer that the recommendation will be solved? Uh, I do, uh, what, what do you mean? Uh, to solve what, what can you repeat the question yeah yes so so joel um is asking uh about what we're recommending um and i i guess i guess what what are the recommendations that we are we, we are saying for the solution maybe a main one main recommendation i guess this is what we're asking uh for me i think that we need this uh, continue to work with uh, colleagues for that. We, we, I would say we are just at a very early beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the monitoring and uh, transforming into acting is a very complex one. Many, many scientific problems. Yeah. Like Alex said, we need to develop uh, SDG models. We need to develop dynamic monitoring process. So yeah. you, you're welcome, and maybe we can work together to organize some same workshops in China or other places. You're welcome to to the team to have a look and have okay, discussing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's great. Yes, definitely collaboration and um, uh, encouraging this effort. This a uh, great effort that you've been doing. Um, uh, this 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 presentation has really been super interesting. Thank you all to all the participants, and thank you to Professor Yun Chen, to all of my colleagues for the support. Uh, thank you for joining us, and see you for the next uh, series lecture. Okay, thank you.